So good evening, everyone. So tonight we are talking about the topic of why I believe God is real. And I guess the advantage of tonight's topic is it, it means I get to give you my personal perspective on why I believe God is real. And uh, no doubt you will have your own perspective. There are certain things that really convince you that God is real. Uh, and uh, it would be a good opportunity at the end of tonight, uh, over supper, if you want to share that with uh, whoever you're talking to, just about whether there's anything in particular, what is it that really stands out for you as to why you believe God is real. And of course, it, it usually doesn't come down to just one thing, does it? It's normally several things that we, uh, we accumulate into saying that based on these reasons, I believe that God is real. And so tonight, that's what we want to have a look at. It's just some of the, uh, the, the things that I uh, believe uh, convince me that God is real. And when you reach that point where you're certain that God is real, you get the sort of uh, record that we looked at in Job in 37. Elihu, at the end of his uh, speech here, is starting to talk about where he perceives God is involved on the earth. And it starts off uh, in verse 37. We'll have a look at this while it's still fresh. Uh, in chapter 37, which we read, uh, we have the idea in verse 2 that we hear attentively the noise of his voice and the sound that goeth out of his mouth. So we have this idea that there is this activeness of God on the earth. And in verse 3, he directs it under the whole heaven. still okay? Alright, and uh, because that voice goes out, it directs under the whole heaven and his lightnings unto the end of the earth. And you have this idea of the voice of God roaring and look at some of the things that we pick up here in verse 6. He says to the snow, be thou on the earth. And so he also says to the small rain, and also to the great rain. So here we have the identification that God is active and working uh, in the events that are happening on the earth. In this case, causing it to snow, causing the small rain and causing uh, the great rain. And we've got in verse 10, by the breath of God, frost is given. And so the breadth of the waters is straightened. So God is actively causing the frost as well. He, he describes that as the breath of God. And also in verse 12, and it is turned round about by his counsels that they may do whatsoever he commandeth them that are upon the face of the whole earth. He causeth it to come whether for correction or for his land or for mercy. So we also have the identification here that God has reasons for the things that he does. Uh, in the context of that, the rain, the cloud, the, uh, the frost, uh, we, we have the idea of uh, that coming uh, either for correction, and we can see some of the, uh, the causalities with uh, the heavy rains that uh, that can result in, or for the land. The, the land needs rain to, uh, to be fertile, or for mercy, because the people that are on the earth need that, need that rain as well. And really the, uh, the, the climatic verse in verse 14, Hearken unto this, O Job, stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. And so the, the speech here concludes with the fact that God's works are wondrous. And so we don't know particularly why this character of the Bible was convinced that God was real. Uh, he had his own ideas as well. But what we can see in Job 37 is the result of that, that everything he sees, he sees being, attained, being directed towards God, that God is the one causing those things. And so, in looking at why I believe that God is real, we want to just cover off on four particular points tonight. Uh, and the first of those is what I've uh, titled nano-complexity. Uh, this is, for me, a really 
uh, a really uh, good reason to prove that God is real. You see, in Romans 1 and verse 20, we read, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. And when you start to delve into uh, things that are a very molecular level, right down to the cells and even uh, below that, this nano complexity, then you start to see this wondrous creation, this, uh, these things all working together. And that's why the psalmist in Psalm 139 verse 14 says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. And so when I start to look into nano complexity, looking right down to the, the, the very uh, finite level, right down to the lowest possible level, I can only be amazed at how incredible we are made. And that all these things working together uh, must have been done with some sort of intelligence. And so I just want to use three examples uh, of this uh, looking down at this nano complexity. So I've got a, a couple of vi uh, videos just to um, show. Uh, the, the videos can explain these things very well compared to me. Uh, but what these impress upon me is um, this nano complexity, the way these things work all in tandem and how there must be some intelligence behind these things. Uh, these are only very short, so we'll uh, give it a go. In Darwin's Black Box in 1996, Behe spotlighted and made famous a number of really interesting discoveries that had been occurring in biochemistry and cell biology over the last two or three decades. And what, what biologists, molecular biologists, cell biologists, microbiologists have been discovering is that at the level of individual cells, there are little tiny examples of nanotechnology, little tiny machines at work. The flagellar motor is the one that Behe made most famous. It's a rotary engine that uh, powers a whip-like tail, a protein tail, that functions like a propeller. And it moves the bacterium through liquid enabling the bacterium to essentially track down its food, its food supply. And this little machine includes a rotor, a stator, a drive shaft, a U-joint, bushings, bearings, and a whip-like tail that functions like a propeller. And the machine in some, in some bacterial systems turns at 100,000 RPMs in one direction and can reverse direction on a quarter of a turn and turn 100,000 RPM in the other direction. And bacterial flagellum is a true nanomachine about 40 nanometers in size. It's amazing. I mean, E. coli, salmonella, which are kind of our model systems for the bacterial flagellum, can propel the cell about 20 lengths per second through a very viscous medium, like water, to these organisms. And you extrapolate that to human um, scale. 20 body lengths per second, six foot person, you know, times 20, 120, 120 feet per second. Mark Spitz or Phelps would be setting uh, records with this type of propulsion. It's hardwired into a, 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 signal transduct, a signal transduction circuit that allows the bacterium to sense changes in the sugar gradient in the, uh, in, in the surrounding liquid. This signal transduction system is actually a short-term memory system where the cell is, if it's going in the direction of an attractant, a nutrient that it can use, um, to metabolize, it follows that chemical gradient. If it's a repellent, it will sense that and move in, in the opposite direction. So it's more than just this engine. It's an extraordinary piece of nanotechnology. It's high tech in low life. And so uh, just by spotlighting these extraordinary pieces of nanotechnology inside cells, and the flagellar motor wasn't the only one, one by any means, Behe, in a sense, opened up 
uh, a window for people. He opened up the black box of the, of the inner workings of the cell and said, look, this is much more complica complex than anything that, than, than anything that the early evolutionary biologists had envisioned. Darwin knew nothing of this type of nanotechnology in cells, and at the very least, we've got to come up with an explanation for this. So it's interesting the way that he ends that to say, uh, we, you know, we have to come up with a, uh, an explanation for this. And as we uh, delve even further down, we find more and more complexity. And uh, w what we have there is a, is a flagellum rotor, which is doing all this work. And so the natural question is, how did it, how did it get there? How, how did it get to the point where it was doing that? It, um, certainly suggest intelligent design. And of course, tonight is not a talk on uh, creation versus evolution, but certainly as we start to look at these things, we get a real sense of some of the, uh, the complexity in our design. Uh, the next one uh, that we want to have a look at is uh, the day in the life of a motor protein. So this is, again, it's another thing which is, uh, in this case, it's inside the brain, and it really... Uh, gives me uh, a great sense of comfort knowing that this, this thing, this part of us at such a minute level uh, was designed to do a certain thing. So we'll just have a look at this one as well. Our brain is made of billions of nerve cells and they're all connected. If we take a closer look a nerve cell seems to have antennas. Most of them are receivers of information, but only one is a transmitter, called the axon. This axon is connected to several receivers of other cells, forming a gigantic neural network, the brain. Meet John. John is a kinesin, a motor protein. He lives inside a nerve cell, and he has a proper job. To ensure that a brain cell does his job properly, it needs the continuous flow of building materials, proteins. They travel through the cell using the cytoskeleton. If you would compare a nerve cell with a city, the cytoskeleton inside the cell would be the roads and the travelling proteins would be the traffic. These materials are towed by motors along the roads. And just as in real life, there are different kinds of motors and different kinds of roads. John's sole purpose in life is to deliver his cargo to a specific place in the axon. He takes the main roads and he walks in just one direction only. John's job may seem easy, but it's not. He has to overcome a number of obstacles to ensure that the right amount of cargo arrives at the right place to make the journey even more difficult. John is not alone. Other motor proteins ride along with his cargo. They haven't woken up yet, but that will happen soon. The journey starts in the center of the city, just like in the center of the cell. To enter the axon, John has to pass a place called the axon initial segment. In this segment, there are two kinds of roads. The main roads that John uses, called the microtubules, and a lot of little alleys called actin. And here, our brave motor protein meets his first challenge because one of his sleeping travel companions, myosin, has woken up and starts to cling to the actin. And there are a lot of alleys. Only brute force can save John now. Fate strikes again. The other companion, Dainin, wakes up and he can only walk in the opposite direction of John, resulting in a tug of war. But 
there can be only one. Along the axon in which John travels, there are places called synapses. Here, the axon connects to receivers of the other cells. Regulating proteins call the shots here. This traffic police makes sure that all passing traffic gets to the right destination. If John's cargo is needed in this synapse, he will be stopped and myosins take over his load. But today, John's cargo is safe. But what he does not know, that his road is under construction, just a few blocks away. In our nerve cells, the cytoskeleton is changing constantly. Roads are built, but are also broken down. Facing this kind of obstruction, John has to find a detour. John isn't the only motor protein on the road. There are many more. Our nerve cells need a smooth traffic flow in order to perform well. A traffic jam due to problems during the journey may ultimately result in brain disease. Understanding the challenges John faces could improve treatment or prevention. Finally, John arrives at his destination. He has fulfilled his destiny. But several other Johns are just getting started. So again, when we, uh, when we consider the, uh, all of the interrelated things that need to go right there and uh, the complexity of that sort of system, uh, it, it, it definitely shows to me that uh, this is something that needed to have been designed, that it couldn't have all happened by chance. Uh, and there's, uh, as, the, as the video mentioned, when things start to go wrong, that's when uh, we have brain disease. Uh, when things are all going well and these are all working together, that's when uh, the system works at its most optimum. Uh, one other very short video uh, relates also to... Uh, the information in the DNA. So we'll just take a quick look at this one as well. Here is a cell, the basic unit of all living tissue. In most human cells, there is a structure called the nucleus. The nucleus contains the genome. In humans, the genome is split between 23 pairs of chromosomes. Each chromosome contains a long strand of DNA, tightly packaged around proteins called histones. Within the DNA are sections called genes. These genes contain the instructions for making proteins. When a gene is switched on, an enzyme called RNA polymerase attaches to the start of the gene. It moves along the DNA, making a strand of messenger RNA out of free bases in the nucleus. The DNA code determines the order in which the free bases are added to the messenger RNA. This process is called transcription. Before the messenger RNA can be used as a template for the production of proteins, it needs to be processed. This involves removing and adding sections of RNA. The messenger RNA then moves out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. Protein factories in the cytoplasm, called ribosomes, bind to the messenger RNA. The ribosome reads the code in the messenger RNA to produce a chain made up of amino acids. There are 20 different types of amino acid. Transfer RNA molecules carry the amino acids to the ribosome. The messenger RNA is read three bases at a time. As each triplet is read, a transfer RNA delivers the corresponding amino acid. 
This is added to a growing chain of amino acids. Once the last amino acid has been added, the chain folds into a complex 3D shape to form the protein. Okay, so again, we, uh, when we start to look at the, uh, the DNA and the gene, what we heard from that video is there are instructions for making the proteins. And so the natural question we would ask is, well, what coded that information? Where did that information come from? Is it uh, purely by chance that all that uh, happened to work out that way, or uh, is there an uh, intelligent design behind it? And if we then compare Mother Nature to God, well, actually, only God claims to be the creator. Whether Mother Nature is intelligent or not, there is, Mother Nature has not claimed to be the creator or to have created, whereas God uh, has, has uh, left behind uh, a record and evidence that he is the intelligence behind our existence. And so... What we say is that it, it can't be dumb luck uh, that these things that we've seen are so complex uh, were created. And so you take that logical leap from there and you say, well, if there is some intelligence, uh, then that means something intelligent must have created us. And uh, as I've said, the only, the only intelligence to claim to be the creator is God. And we see that from some of those records there. Genesis 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And in uh, Colossians 1 and verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers or things, all things were created by him and for him. It's interesting when... Uh, the, the writer of Colossians wrote that, obviously, they had a lot less information about some of these things. So things that were invisible in those days are, are now quite visible, and we have uh, much more information about that nano-complexity. Genesis 1 and verse 26, God says, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And really, Hebrews 11 verse 3 uh, gives the conclusion of the matter here that by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. And so when we look at nano complexity, certainly from my perspective, uh, that convinces me that God is real and he claims to be the creator but Hebrews also puts a, a, little, a little extra point on this, and that is this word faith, because I think there is uh, also an element of faith needed as well. We, uh, we, we see God claiming to be the creator. We have all the evidence of this complexity that suggests design. And so by faith, we therefore conclude that God is the creator and that God is real. And when you start to think about God's claims, it's not just that God claimed to be the creator. He gave us the Bible, of course, which uh, contains many other points. But when we look at the record here in Isaiah 46, verse 9 to 10, we find something else. God claims, I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So God claims to know the end from the beginning. And so, yes, we take this logical leap around complexity and the fact that that means God is real, but we can also test God's claim on other things. And God claims to know the end from the beginning. And when we start to look at prophecy, we can, uh, we can start to test that a little bit more. This is something which is quite tangible for us to test. Have a look at the prophecy. And if God prophesied something and it came true, then we can take a great deal of, of confidence that God is real. 
So let's, let's test very briefly uh, one or two of God's prophecies. And we're going to use the prophecy of Tyre. Uh, this is uh, purely coincidental that there was some record this morning around uh, Hiram, uh, the other Hiram from Tyre who uh, helped to build the temple. Uh, but it's, it's quite fitting then that we would look at this one as well. And uh, Hiram, the king of Tyre, the other Hiram, not, not the one we looked at this morning, uh, from between 980 BC and 947 BC, there's some records in the Bible about his involvement and, and, um, and also Tyre and, and their involvement as well. We have uh, recorded in 2 Samuel 5 uh, that uh, he built uh, King David a house. In 1 Kings 5, that uh, Tyre helped Solomon with materials for the uh, building temple. And also in 1 Kings 9, he had a joint overseas trade alliance with Solomon. So Tyre and, and, and Israel had a very close relationship. Uh, but what we find is that that relationship uh, over time starts to uh, dissolve. And so God then prophesies against Tyre. And here on the screen are just some of the records where we have uh, recorded around uh, the prophecy of Tyre. Uh, Isaiah 23 prophesied of the downfall uh, of the nation. Amos 1 verses 9 to 10 that they would be punished for neglecting the brotherly covenant. Zechariah 9 that they would be cast out and devoured with fire. Jeremiah 25, that they would uh, drink of the cup of fury. Also Jeremiah 27, they would come under the control of Nebuchadnezzar. And Ezekiel 26 prophesied in quite uh, a good amount of detail the downfall of Tyre. And these are some of the things that we read in Ezekiel 26 concerning that downfall of Tyre. The record tells us that Nebuchadnezzar would destroy the main city, that the debris of that city would be thrown into the water, that the city would become a bare rock, that many nations would come against Tyre, that the city would never be rebuilt, that fishermen would spread their nets over the site. And so if we now look at whether or not this happened to occur, we can uh, if, if it does, if it does occur, if it has occurred in history, we can have the confidence that God's claim is true and therefore God is true and real. Because this is, this is quite specific. There's a lot of very specific parts to this prophecy. And what we find in history is that these things did happen exactly as God prophesied. They didn't happen all at once either. They happened over a period of time. And so you have that city-state of Tyre, the mainland city and the island city. In 573 BC, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the mainland city of Tyre. Uh, he sieged the city for 13 years and when he moved into the city, he discovered that all of the people had fled to that island city. And so King Nebuchadnezzar and his armies left and the people of the island city thought that they were safe. But he certainly uh, destroyed that mainland city of Tyre. And then, over 200 years later, we have King Alexander coming against the mainland city. And he comes down to that city and he discovers that that city is in ruins. And as his armies are there, so the story goes, the people in the island city were taunting his armies, saying, you can't come after us, we're completely safe, good luck with that. And of course, this enraged King Alexander. So what he did is he ordered his men to build a causeway. So his men started collecting the uh, debris from that mainland city and they started to build this causeway, thus fulfilling that prophecy the part of the prophecy that said that the city would be thrown into the water. And so King Alexander and his armies are building this causeway so that they can get out to the, uh, the, the island. And on top of that, King Alexander calls the nations that he had conquered, such as Sidon and Cyprus and many other nations. They come down 
against Tyre as well, thus fulfilling the prophecy that many nations would come against Tyre. And of course, Alexander uh, destroyed that city at the time and uh, what we find is in AD 1291, the remnants of Tyre uh, were utterly destroyed by the Muslims um, during the Crusades. And it's at this point in AD 1291 that the city was completely uh, ruined and that's where the, ru the ruins remain today. So this ancient city of Tyre have, has never been rebuilt. In fact, what remains is a small fishing village and there's a photo of a, a fisherman casting and uh, drying their nets on the rock. So what an amazing prophecy in such finite detail, We're talking not only about the king but about the debris being thrown into the, the water, the fact that fishermen would dry their nets there. And what we see is that is fulfilled over a period of time exactly as God prophesied. And this gives me an amazing amount of confidence that God is real. Of course, God prophesied many other things as well, and we don't have time, of course, to look at a lot of them in detail. But another one which I think is really uh, an amazing prophecy is taken from Daniel 2. And uh, we all know the, the record of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, where he dreamt of that image that had a uh, head of gold and... Uh, arms and, and uh, chest of um, silver and uh, the, the lower belly of uh, bronze and the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay and he sees in that vision that rock come and smash that, uh, that image up, grinds it to powder and then the rock forms uh, a mountain which covers the whole earth. And Daniel comes in and Daniel interprets that vision for him and he gives an, a, a remarkable prophecy about the future nations. We know that Daniel said, well, King Nebuchadnezzar, you're that head of gold. And we know how Nebuchadnezzar responded because he then went out and built that image of gold for people to worship. And then Daniel describes that another nation would come who would, would uh, take over power from Babylon but would not be quite so powerful, hence the silver. And then another nation would come along that would uh, gain the power. And then another nation would come after that until that degraded into what we have today as the modern powers. So just as Daniel uh, prophesied in each of those kingdoms coming and replacing another, so exactly is what we see in history with the Medo-Persian Empire replacing the Babylonian Empire and the Greek Empire replacing the Medo-Persian and the Roman Empire replacing the Greek until we have uh, a mixture of the iron and clay today in our modern powers. And there's one part of that prophecy that we know hasn't yet been fulfilled and that's the rock coming down and smashing that image. So here's a prophecy that spans such a, a, a long time and yet is still future to us as well as we await the time when Jesus Christ will return to the earth and smash those powers and uh, establish God's kingdom that will fill the whole earth. And we can have absolute comfort in the fact that that will happen because all those other elements of the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron have all occurred through history. And so to me prophecy is another reason why I believe that God is real. Prophecy that has been fulfilled right down to some of those finite levels that we saw with Tyre and also here with Nebuchadnezzar's image. Well, the third reason why I believe that God is real actually comes down to a word called providence. But even more specific to that is uh, a place that we, you may have heard of called Boomer Beach in Victor Harbour. And what we're getting into now is something uh, a lot more personal from my perspective uh, when it comes to my belief that God is real. And it's about the, the, the providence that we see, the evidence of providence in our lives where mirac uh, miraculous things have happened that can't be explained by anything other than God's providence 
And uh, when I was three years old, uh, one of four children at the time, I was laying on the beach in Boomer Beach with uh, my brother and my sister, uh, both older than me, and my parents were further back attending to uh, the youngest, the, the newborn. And uh, when my parents looked back, there was only two children left because I was gone. And what had happened is that a wave had come over and smashed into us and sucked me out to sea. And by the time my parents turned around and saw that I was gone, there they could see me bobbing away off into the deep ocean. And so, of course, my dad naturally ran immediately into the water. And as he was running to try to catch up with me, as the, the sea was drifting me out further away, uh, he lost his balance just as he was about ready to grab me, lost his balance, went under the water, and uh, when he came back up, he had lost sight of me, and uh, that instant reaction where he couldn't see where I was. And uh, just as he was looking around, suddenly a, a wave basically picked me up and, and lifted me up and, and virtually pushed me right into my father's hands. Uh, and of course, I'm here today, so, uh, the, so that, that act of that wave pushing me into my father's hands uh, saved my life on that day. And for me, I believe God is real because I believe in providence and I believe that God is playing a part in our lives. And I honestly believe that that wave was there at that time because of God's uh, providence in my life. And of course, we hear stories about people who have come to a knowledge of God through something so minute or uh, unusual or coincidental that you, you would hardly believe it. Someone who sits on a train and there's a leaflet sitting there that they start to read and suddenly they get some interest. Or uh, someone who meets a friend at school and um, hears them talking about the truth and suddenly there's that spark of interest. I think that many of us have experienced or have seen or, or have heard of some level of providence that God plays today. And that really comes down to a very personal thing, doesn't it? It's something personal for each of us. There's no uh, evidence, there's no uh, proof that it was God in those events for all these people, but we have faith and we believe that God is directing our steps. And when you consider uh, verses like Deuteronomy 31 and verse 6, be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And so we get that comfort, don't we, that God is with us, that God will not fail us and that God will not forsake us. It's that providential care of God in our lives today, seen through the ages. Isaiah 41 verse 10 also uh, from the Amplified Version, Fear not, there is nothing to fear, for I am with you. Do not look around you in terror and be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen and harden you to difficulties. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will hold you up and retain you with my victorious right hand of righteousness and justice. And so you have the sense of God being in control of our lives, God being involved in our lives, and his helping hand is there whenever, whenever we need it. And so the third reason why I believe that God is real is because of the evidence that we see of his providence, not only uh, today, but also throughout the ages. And I think the final or well, the fourth reason that we're covering tonight relating to why I believe God is real is because God offers a hope of salvation. And we've got the, uh, the, the verse from Proverbs 29, verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. And so when you have a look at a grave site today, you have hundreds and hundreds of graves of people who had no vision people that died, and that's the end of their life. But the, the verse goes on, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. 
And so amongst these many graves, you have the odd one or two, the, the graves relating to those people that did believe that God was real, that had a vision and kept his law. And, and those people, they died happy because they've got a future hope, a hope of something that takes us beyond our mortal life. You see, God promised in John 17, verse 3, that this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And so I believe God is real because God offers that hope of salvation, of something beyond just our mortal life today. And he promises in Numbers 14 and verse 21 to fill the whole earth with his glory. So why do I believe that God is real? Well, I believe that God is real because when you look at nano complexity, it just indicates that we are beautifully designed, that we are very complex. When we look at prophecy, we can see that what God prophesied has come to pass. When we consider our own lives, we see evidence of his care and his providence in our lives. And I believe God is real because he gives us a hope of salvation, life eternal and the whole earth filled with the glory of the Lord. Thank you.